It's a good year to talk about astronomy. It is the international year of astronomy, as Paul has very rightly turned out. And I should say Paul's done a lot of work, and I, I must congratulate him on the Institute of Physics and all the groups around Ireland who are doing an incredible job. Uh, what we have been doing is uh, working with school teachers across the province in Northern Ireland. We, do, we are in all Ireland. The Armagh Planetarium is an all-Ireland organisation. But we can't possibly do all corners of Ireland. There's only three people. So we have a memorandum of understanding with Black Rock Castle Observatory in Cork. And some of the projects we work on uh, use things like this. Have any of you ever been inside a portable planetarium? I hope some of you have, yeah. It's an incredible experience. This is, uh, you may recognise, the Ulamax Theatre. Uh, and UCC, and these were kids that were brought in by the Access Program. This is important, guys, that you should talk the Access Programs, widen your participation units. Nearly all the universities, colleges, Institute of Technologies have these groups that are more than keen to talk to school children and are more than keen to talk about their science and their technology. They are a free resource. You should really try and make closer links with them because they're doing the real science and technology that the kids will be using in the future. Science festivals, well, I mean, National Science Week across Ireland is a phenomenon. This was in Galway, uh, the Galway Science Festival. They have lots of balloons, it's a great idea. This is a public day. And to give an idea of the power of space and astronomy, this is actually a talk I gave on the Hubble Space Telescope at the concert hall at the University of Limerick. It was 1,400 kids turned up for that. I thought Ronan Keating was coming or something. It wasn't. It was for me to give a talk on astronomy. Um, I should point out, when they turned the lights off, it reminded me a bit of the film Gremlins, but because uh, it was meant to be an interactive presentation to 1,400 kids, wow. Uh, but it was the imagery, they came to see imagery, and it's how you use that imagery as a tool, and how you use astronomy and space as a tool to create interactive processes uh, with school children. BT Young Scientist, again, is a typical one. And the reason why I cite things like this is I have found that the best way to get the school children involved is to see the work of other school children and see how much they have enjoyed the experience. So if there's an astronomy project of worth here, most of the other kids will come along and go, that's really cool, I want to do that. And then they get involved. It's all very well doing something in the school. Even in your own school, you should make sure those kids show their work off, that they stand in front of the rest of the school and explain what they've done, if it's a good project, that they have it up for World Space Week. I mean, there's different times of the year, like World Space Week is 4th to the 10th of October. You have Yuri's Night, which celebrates Yuri Gagarin's times uh, in the space. You've got all sorts of different times. Maths Week's another one, of course. We've got Maths Week. You should actually get the kids to show off the work then, to try and create some impetus within the school for science and technology. Um, and I am also very keen to work with other groups, as I said, beyond traditional science. This is a lovely little project. And all I'm doing here, folks, is I'm just giving you some ideas, because you may want to try some of this. We did it with the Armagh Planetarium and, and the Ulster Orchestra, where they were showing Holst the Planet Suite. And what we did was we went to the Portable Planetarium and we explained to them, the kids, what would it be like on other planets? What would it sound like? What would life be like if you had to go there? And some of the compositions, they worked with the professional musicians. Now this could be the music teacher in the school to create compositions around the science. So they learned about the planets on Uranus that had wind chimes and glockenspiels going. And then these are, these are kids, you know, eight, eight to ten years old. These aren't secondary school kids. They presented their compositions at the Ulster Hall on the opening night. So the Ulster Orchestra and all the crowd, and they did their own planet suites that they had composed with music uh, educators and music. So it's really brilliant ways of integrating the science into Saturday without dumbing down the science. I know you're all very keen not to do that, as am I. Uh, this is the Queen's University, again, widening participation units. This is rocket launching, so how do you get the other planets? Well, you've got to get off the ground first. So the physics and maths behind that, um, you can get very cheap kits. You can make your own kits, actually. And I'm going to give you websites, by the way, later, of where to find all of this material. And here you can see young children made their own rockets and fired them off into a very rare Queen's blue sky. <laughs> here. Also important, the changing demographic of Ireland. The population is changing. How do you integrate people into society? Astronomy and space science is a very good way to do it because all the cultures have their own way of looking at the night sky. We all look at the same stars. We just interpret them differently, whether it be through the, the patterns in the sky or through the, our religious ethos. And in Northern Ireland, what we did is we worked with the Chinese uh, to start with. There was a very good reason for this because after we started stopped beating the hell out of each other, we started beating the hell out of the Chinese for no reason that I could find out why. It was appalling. And I couldn't understand what was going on. So what we did is for the Chinese New Year, we actually uh, worked with the Chinese authorities and the Chinese Welfare Association for school children to create um, uh, cultural heritage projects related on astronomy from their country and then show it to the other school children. 
Now think about that in the schools that you work in. It's a really powerful tool. You may have Hindu, you may have Buddhism, you may have all the different societies. Get them to talk about the science from their countries and then show them off throughout the school. It's a really nice way to look at the different aspects of culture around the world and the changing demographic of Ireland. This is an important one too. Ask Regazers Ireland. Maybe some of you the schools are members. Uh, this is something I set up 10 years ago and it's been very successful. Uh, website, first website's the Armagh Planetarium website. I'm not selling the Armagh Planetarium here, I'm just showing where free resources are. www.armaplanet.com. Go there, you'll see Astrogazers. Join the club, because it does not cost a penny. And the reason I said is, if I had to come here with all the resources that are available, you would all be going home with a tractor load, okay? There's no way I could do it. But if you join the club, that stuff's free. It comes from the European Space Agency, it comes from the European Southern Observatory, some of the stuff you've probably already got in your packs. But there's posters, there's projects. You find out what other schools in your region are doing stuff and you may want to join in. It's a totally free network. And we will send the stuff freely to you as and when it becomes available. So your school gets the latest educational resources through the Astrogazers network. So that is very, very important. And you can see here very interestingly, mostly, most of the clubs in the north are girls. It's mostly girls, I found that quite interesting. Uh, that it was the girls who were taking up the astronomy. They really enjoyed the imagery and they really enjoyed you know, the project skills that were coming out of it. And they found it something that, 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 that they could work together as a team. So I think it's 40, you know, 60% of all the clubs are girls' schools doing astronomy. I think it's fantastic. I think it's really, really good. And of course, getting the kids to show off the work. Now I mentioned earlier, where possible, use the best technology. I realize we've all got limited resources. But where possible, use emerging technology and use the best technology. The technology you would use in real world. So scientists use really high-powered telescopes. If you could get your hand on a really high-powered telescope, then you would use it too. But they cost nine million pounds, which is a bit expensive. Actually, it isn't. It's completely free. Have any of you heard of the Fox Telescope? I see a couple of nodding heads, yeah? Uh, this is another group, by the way. You'll see this is another girl. Um, also get sponsors. I know the, the word sponsor in this day and age is very difficult to get. I'm looking at Sheila and we know exactly what that's like. Um, but this is Northern Ireland Electricity. Got involved with the astronomy projects because they could see the skills in ICT that the kids were getting. It was the skills that got the sponsors aboard. But when we're doing teacher training in the North, we try to do uh, a lot of computer-based learning because all the schools are very well resourced with uh, PCs in the North. And one of the projects that we work on with teachers is the Fox Robotic Telescope Project. These aren't kids' telescopes. These are research-grade telescopes in research-grade locations used by scientists for real science projects. Now, Dill Fox would kill me if he saw that photo. Uh, this is the man behind it, uh, Dill Fox. I think he's just found out that his millions uh, have just been hit by the recession, hence both hands are full. But fantastic guy. This is a, a cosmologist uh, and mathematician who uh, worked in Silicon Valley. Um, he came back to the UK and he wanted to give something back to the education. So he built these telescopes out of his own fund, some money from STFC, formerly known as PPARC, the Particle Physics Astronomy Research Council. In actual fact, in the UK, if you didn't get your research grant, you spelled PPARC backwards. And also uh, 0.6 million from the Department for Education. Now, they are massive telescopes, as big as this room. Okay, two meter mirrors, fantastic resource. Completely free to use. I cannot believe they're not being used more. I think it's because teachers think it's a difficult thing to use. All the tools are online. All the resources for teacher training are online and they're all available. The website, I'm going to put it up in a second, the Fox website, is very easy to access. And just to give you an idea of what's going on, the, the, the Fox telescopes, there's two of them. There's one down here in Australia, at the Siding Spring site, and Mount Haleakala in Hawaii. It's called Time Domain Astrophysics. The big problem with doing astronomy in schools is, of course, you have to go outside at night. Um, and there's, apart from the fact that it may be cloudy, the one night that you pick, and I do believe, by the way, you should look at those photons coming through a telescope because it is the most inspirational thing. You should do real observing. But if you can't, it's all the problems with parental forms and getting a bus and getting them back and getting them forward. With this, it's nighttime on those sites when it's daytime in Europe. So you log on right now and you, you're at nighttime in Hawaii on top of the mountain and you can take the image right now. You book it in half hour sessions. And the really good news, as I've said, is it's completely free. This is because of heritage, because of the way things have moved forward with Dill and the UK and Ireland, and that invisible border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. I work on very much on an all-Ireland basis, as does Armagh Planetarium. It just did not make sense that we could only offer this for free in the North. So Dill just said, hey, give it to all the teachers and kids on the island of Ireland. And it is a fantastic experience, because there's an infrared camera as well. 
Um, you'll as physicists, as you shoot with this. You can log on, you press a button, um, you'll see what you can observe that night. If you're an astronomer and you know your right ascension, your declination, your longitude and latitude, you can pick the object you want. Uh, you can pick your own exposure time, but it will give you every guide needed. You cannot point it at the sun and fry the CCD. You cannot point it at the moon and do anything wrong. It will not let you destroy the telescopes. So you're not going to destroy a nine million pound piece of equipment. That's the first thing to point out. Also, when you press the button, it's live. So the telescope, you can actually watch it move. This thing the size this room moves and your kids are controlling it. And the image comes down and it automatically comes to the screen and they get an image from deep space. Let me show you some of the images that come from this. And these are all taken from kids in Ireland. Nope, nope, that's FTN. That's Fox Telescope North. You can see, by the way, this is very uh, volcanic. It's very sparse. But you'll see the clouds are below you. It's very high up and lots of telescopes. This is in Hawaii. And you'll see the difference between FTS, Fox South. That's a totally different location. You know, it's, it's, it's a jungle. I believe something like 10 of the world's most venomous creatures lurk in these jungles. If that's not a good reason for doing robotic observing and remote observing, I don't know why. But it allows you to see both the north and southern hemispheres. Look at the images. I mean, that is not doing justice. You can see it on my screen. These are the types of images that will come from the telescope. Don't require you to process them. You can work out what color filters you want, or you can just say, take a red, green, blue picture. It'll take the exposure. Very easy to do. And look at these images. I recognize this one particularly because we did this in Galway at the Galway Science Festival with uh, Professor Mike Redfern. And this is the live image. And that's a very good image, I have to say, coming down live. That's not processed in any way. I didn't have to go into Photoshop. You can change it. All of those ways how you can use ICT to enhance the photo, change it, work out what science is in there, it's all online. It's very, and it's been written by teachers, by the way, for teachers. Not written by scientists for teachers. That's an important step that we learned. It's written for teachers, by teachers, for teachers. We have RE teachers, religious education teachers, using Fox in the North. They find it a really wonderful resource to just try and explain how big things are and our place in the universe. So I would strongly recommend Fox, F-A-U-L-K-E-S, hyphen telescope.com. Highly recommend going on that site and trying it out. You can book it in half hour slots, guarantee you, once you use this resource, you'll not go back to another resource because it just is that you are doing real discovery. You're doing real science with real equipment, you know, and it's just incredible. Give you an idea of just how good it is. This is a very famous image from the Hubble Space Telescope called the Pillars of Creation and the Eagle Nebula. Basically, these are large areas of star formation, the stellar wombs. And Hubble's quite expensive. It's in space, so if you, it needs an MOT or it needs fixed, you've got to send astronauts there. Costs a lot of money. Look at this image. I'm now going to show you an image from Fox. I think you'd agree. That's pretty good. And certainly don't have to send astronauts into space to get the image fixed, but there. So they're research-grade telescopes. You can do really good science with these. Of course, I'm glad to say, and again, I always try, I always say to Paul as well, I know Paul likes me to do this, is to point out, I realize as teachers in class, we can sometimes feel a bit isolated. What you're doing, your best practice, you should share. You should share with other teachers. You should blog it. You should use all the multimedia and blog within it. I tend to blog globally. So a lot of the best practice in Northern Ireland is actually being used in places like Nigeria and Tanzania, which is fantastic. They're using the Northern Ireland curriculum in Tanzania and Nigeria, adapting it for their own needs and their own skills. And, and some, I haven't got time to talk about people, but I have to point out uh, Alice Lee. Alice Lee has the best job title on earth, Director General of the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs. <laughs> what a job title. Uh, if Alice ever sees this, she'll kill me for saying, but I actually think her, 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 her job description and her little card is bigger than her. Yes. Um, well, you all know what they're doing, okay? They're all trying to work out the size of the solar system with their thumbs. So simple interventions. Do try and share your best practice where possible. And you're all physicists here. I'm sure you're all doing some really interesting stuff that I'd like to know about, but do try to blog about it. Try and share it within the school. Try and share it with other teachers. Try and use the inspiration that you have to push it out to other teachers. I think it's very important. I know it's easy enough for me to say this with everything else that goes on in the classroom, but it is important, I think. It's important from the astronomer's point of view, I have to put this in real context from science. Astronet was the, uh, a funding um, plan, so it's, a, it's basically the big roadmap for the next 20 years of all European astronomy. I sat on one of the panels. Interestingly enough, the astronomers even note the importance of teachers. So astronomers know that you are the supply chain. Without you teaching the kids, we're not going to have future astronomers. And panel A was divided into five groups, university education research, and number two, right there, school education across Europe. We're not going to have the supply chain of astronomers and the skill sets that we need in 10 years if it's not for the interventions of fantastic teachers like yourselves pushing the agenda forward. So it really is important, guys, what you're doing in the classroom. It really, really is vital. 
A bit more closer to home for me. This is the Northern Ireland curriculum. Um, you'll not be able to see it at the back, I don't expect you to, okay? You haven't got any telescopes down the back there. Um, but you'll notice connected learning, why something, and the thematic units. This is where I had interventions. You'll notice it's called Underneath the Stars, and you'll notice that it falls under spiritual awareness. The science falls under spiritual awareness. And a very simple reason for this, and I do see frowned looks, I got this a lot, but there's a very good reason for this. A, we had no idea how we're going to do spiritual awareness in Northern Ireland without causing a real <laughs> problem. Um, secondly, let's look at you know, the, the history of astronomy. Who were the astronomers? It really did. It came from, it was, who were the people that did the cartography of the stars? It, if you look at Ireland, it was very much that came from the monks, that came from the theological centers. So there's a real heritage there. Also, it is the bigger questions. It's the bigger questions. How old? How big? How far? When did it start? When will it end? Using astronomy and space science to tackle those really difficult questions. And what I'm really, really glad of is that the RE, the religious education teachers in, in Northern Ireland, are loving this. They're absolutely loving it. It's real theology. It's really the big questions that they want to push forward. And they're using scientific resources to do it, which is great. It's absolutely fantastic. How does it work? Well, you've probably all heard this from the NCCA, the idea of using skills, the skills agenda, you know, developing processes, creative thinking. I'm sure you've heard it all before. Um, well, STEM, you all know what STEM is, science, technology, engineering, and maths, is critical, of course. But then what we do is we work with the English teachers. For example, in English literature, Robert Frost wrote a poem in the 1940s, looking at the electrification of America and how it may affect our night skies in the future. Light pollution. He was talking about this in the 1940s. So we get the kids to interrogate poems and the literature to see how it's influenced the way society has developed. In religious education, we look at all the different religions and we look at festivals. Are they affected? Is Buddhism or, 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 or Christianity or is the Muslim faith, is it affected in any way by celestial events, by the, 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 the passing of the moon? Has it been affected by the plants? The answer is yes, it is embedded in there. It's a very non-contentious way to look at all the different religions in Ireland. And it works very, very well. And you're doing some really good research, data analysis when you're doing that. It falls underneath what's called the Thinking Skills and Personal Capabilities Framework. Again, you'll see something very similar, not just in the NCCA. You'll see this in England. Scotland's got its vocational skills. France has got its own uh, version now within the baccalaureate where they're looking at the skills agenda because they realize that they've got to change the future economy. And all over America, you're seeing the skills, 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 skills. So managing information, thinking, problem solving, being creative, self-management, working with others, that's the framework it falls under. And then we try and put the astronomy in, into that context. Where can we embed those skills and those processes? It's the process of learning. Not so much getting the kids' heads filled with stuff to pass exams, which we know is critical. But how do we get them to learn? What is the process? And how can we make them take control of the process? And teachers act as the facilitators of that knowledge. That's important. You're not going to see it. It's way too small. Uh, but what you may be able to see is the diagram. Where this says science and geography, art and design, technology and design. The science and geography was looking at extreme life forms. So what is extreme life form? I mean, if you go to the North Pole, you might say it's pretty cold here. That's pretty extreme. What are extre what is extreme uh, what are the extreme environments? And what sort of life do you find there? And then, do you find other worlds? Can you find other places or think of other places in our solar system where those conditions may exist, where you may find life? Now, each one of the units that we have done in the North, I'll have to explain this to, to get the idea of where we're coming from. The science teacher I'm aware of may just want to do science. It may not even like the art teacher. So as a scientist, you can do your science. As a maths teacher, you can do your math. But where there can be interactions, they're made explicit. And they're put in the ethic awareness, media, uh, cultural understanding, employability. That's the strands that goes on there. So they can actually see how you can work together. So what we're trying to do is get schools to work together right across the board. So instead for six weeks, you go into school as a pupil and you learn about a standard form in maths. Then you go into science and you do something like Hooke's Law. And then you go and learn something about Shakespeare and Van Gogh. It's a very disjointed learning experience. The context is space and astronomy for six weeks in every classroom. And what we're seeing is that the kids, it's anecdotal at the minute, but what we're seeing are the kids are starting to retain the knowledge more because it becomes more embedded, it becomes more relevant right across the board. And I think that's very, very important. So we would really strongly suggest where possible you get those interactions together. Now, I'm going to finish that because I want to do the cool stuff and Paul's going to throw me out of the room. But to find that, um, I would say go to the CA website, but it's like all of these big, massive websites, you won't find it. So what I would suggest is you Google it. And all you need to Google is underneath the stars, I think that's a song by somebody, isn't it? Um, underneath the stars, and then NI for Northern Ireland, NI thematic units. 
And what you will find there is all of the resources. And the really important thing here, guys, is that the resources have been peer measured by teachers like yourself. So these work. We had hundreds of resources, many of which we threw out because we just didn't think around. These were science teachers, religious education teachers, English teachers, math teachers, all looking at these resources and going, these are good, these are too complicated, these are for really uh, able students. And they're all catalogued there. And every single resource that you will find there is completely free. Okay, so it won't cost you a penny. That's very important. A very free resource. So there's no point in me handing them all out now because I think there's 180 websites. Uh, they're also categorized. So it'll be planets, stars, galaxies. It's that easy to find. And then the links are there, English literature, mathematics, physics, chemistry, and how you can use them. I should point out it's 11 to 14 at the minute, so that's for 11 to 14. But it has been deliberately written so that if you want to use the stuff at 15 to 16, when that process comes along, it'll work. And if you want to use it at the primary school, it'll work. It's the middle of the journey. All of this stuff can be downstream, it's supposed to be the technical term, or upstreamed, the, the higher education. It just happens to be that's where the funding was and that's where the changes took place. And another thing as physics teachers I do want you to be aware of is that you do have power. You are a lobby group because it's what I do do also with the astrogators. And I know certainly I was talking to Mike and Paul and people like this. The NCCA will be changing the curriculum. They always do. They change ideas. If you're interested in astronomy and space science, you are the group that can go to them and say, listen, we really would like to see this within the curriculum. Because ministers, I've, I've learned this, I shouldn't say this to camera, but I've always learned that a minister will not do anything if there's no real justification or they think their neck's on the line. But if it's the teachers coming to them and saying, hey, there's 80 teachers here say this should be in the curriculum. Well, they'll go, well, I didn't make the decision, the teachers did. Ministers like that, they really do. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish this little bit. And if I could ask, uh, if you could hand out 3D glasses, please. You're all going to get a set of super sexy polarized glasses to put on now, okay? So wear them with pride, and I'll be with you in two seconds. I just need to set this system up. It takes me a minute, okay? Okay. I should point out for those in camera land, hello over there, this is in 3D stereo, so it's not going to work for you, okay? Unless, of course, you go outside and drink 20 pints, and then it'll look fine, okay? Okay, and I need a pair of glasses as well, just to make sure it works. So we don't have much time, as always, we're running short of time. It is a Saturday as well, and we've all got a life, but apart from me, I don't have any life. But what I'm going to do is uh, quickly show, I might not have time to show you, I'm going to show you a video, because there's different types of stereoscopic animation. What I'm interested in is interaction, it's something that you can play with as teachers, okay? First thing I'm going to, hello, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a little piece of animation that was created for the International Year of Astronomy. It was created for BT Young Scientist. Um, and it was a creation by myself from the Northern Ireland Space Office, Lars Lindbergh Christensen from the European Space Agency and ESO Hubble Space Education Team, and Jose Francisco Salgado from Adler Planetarium. All of the videos you see here has been pieced together. Ne sorry, not all, but all of the really cool videos and things flying around and space themes are free, another website, and a brilliant website. You've paid for it, so you should feel very happy to use it. Spacetelescope.org, www.spacetelescope.org. That is the homepage for the European Space Agency's Hubble Space Telescope program. Hubble is not just NASA, it's run both by ESA and NASA. So go there, you'll see some of the most amazing animations. So if your pupils want to work on a multimedia project, and, and put in top class video animations as MPEGs or as QuickTime or um, want to learn a bit more about science and embed stuff, do it there because all the stuff also has commentary written by a science communicator that's accurate so you'll find all the accurate information with the right captions. Now, I just need to calibrate this because this is a bit of a research tool. But there are 30 of these, not this, this is a big one I'm using with you guys. There are 30 of these systems now in the UK, by the way, in schools. Schools are starting, trust me, in 10 years time, you're going to see it on. I just need to align this. So you can help me align it. <coughs> Pardon me. If you close your, oh, that's wrong, start off with. Okay, so. Paul, what do I like for time? You're gonna say something very bad, I know you are. 15. 15 minutes, so I can't, I can't show all of this, I will not have time. Um, 
but what I can do, because I want to show you a bit of Celestia as well, and we'll apply. This is going to look really weird, folks. It's not the dry side. It's gone completely up the left. It's just a... Okay, let's try it again. Your left eye should be seeing red and your right eye should be seeing green. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So this is just a little bit. So I also want to point out, by, by the way, have any of you ever made a, a really fancy PowerPoint demo for the school children? Or you think it's really fancy? And you've embedded lots of animations and flashing videos. And at the end of it, you've realized, hmm, the kids just looked at the flashing videos and paid no attention to what I was saying whatsoever. We all tend to do that information overload. What we've done here is not all 3D. I'm doing it exactly the same way I do with PowerPoint demo. If I want to emphasize a point, I use 3D, so things come out of the screen. It's like the movies. If you go to a movie, a horror movie, um, if it was 3D the whole time, it doesn't work. It's when you want to embed an ax in somebody's head, that's when you want the 3D. Doing exactly the same thing. If we want to uh, look, for example, at the rings of Saturn and Equinox, what does that mean? I want the rings to come out of the screen. Now, we're only going to have about five, ten minutes, so I'm not going to be able to show you all of this, but I'll give you an idea. And I, by the way, I think this is also on spacetelescope.org, but not in 3D because we created it as a video. So, Another very important thing you'll notice, but I, I'm, I'm quite musical, I like music, and I think music is a very important thing when you're telling stories, having the right music. So the music is also on the website, it's completely free. We worked with a bunch of uh, uh, musicians from Munich uh, called One to One. They made the music, and it's free, so. But hopefully you'll just find this beautiful. Remember, not all of this is 3D, so some of it, just keep the glasses on, works fine. You'll see the stereoscopic animations when they happen. One Earth, One Sky. I think it's a very, very good slogan. Because it is the same night sky that our ancestors saw that we saw today. It hasn't changed much. You'll see a website there. If I haven't mentioned it already, the Irish node is www.astronomy2009.ie. Okay, not odd. That is this, the, uh, what's going on now. We will be putting lots of educational material in there as well. And we encourage teachers, if they have great resources, please tell us and we will embed them. I think that'll be a brilliant heritage. Now, when we talk about astronomy, International Year of Astronomy, it's 400 years since Galileo Galileo pointed his telescope to the sky. It really helped the scientific revolution. But think back five, six hundred years ago. Imagine looking up at the sky and not knowing anything about your place in space. What do you see? You see the sun rising in the east, the moon rising, the planets, uh, stars rising, and setting in the west. It's very easy to believe that you were at the center of the universe. But it was with Galileo's little telescope, and here's an animation of it, that we were able to look at the moons going around Jupiter, the phases of Venus and Mercury. He wasn't the first one to come up with what's called a heliocentric model, the sun in the middle, but it was his observations were the proof to push that theory forward. It was the observations. Why can we see so far into space? Well, it's because space is very transparent. The photons of light, the energy can travel unbelievable distances for unimaginable scales of time. They will travel through space, they can arrive in our Milky Way millions and billions of years later. They arrive at planet Earth, and a billionth of a second, just before they go into your lens and into your eye, they have to go through our atmosphere. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, it breaks up the image. So how do you counteract that? 
Well, we tend to put our telescopes in quite exotic locations. For example, this is the Atacama Desert in Chile. And this is your, you own this, by the way, it's the very large telescope, or extremely large telescope, no, the VLT. And if you look on top, by the way, can you all see a rectangular building here? Have any of you seen the James Bond movie, Quantum of Solace? That was the baddies lair, that's where they filmed it. Um, it's about six kilometers up. It hasn't rained in over 100 years. It's incredibly dry. So it's a really good observing site. Each one of these telescopes is over eight meters across the mirror. They can be joined together through an interferometer, but they can all work independently. So it's a really powerful tool. However, we are still within the atmosphere. And a lot of the wavelengths are still lost. Some very important wavelengths if you want the big picture. So if you want an absolutely pristine image of the sky, you must go one step further, and that is into space. And that is why in space we have our observatory. It's actually a household name now, Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope. It's not the biggest telescope we've ever designed, it's about a meter odd across, so it's nowhere near as big as those. But it has an uninterrupted view of the heavens. And as we look at it here, we'll put it into stereo to give you an idea of what it looks like. You'll see it's a light bucket. It collects the light, sends the signal to another satellite, and back to the planet Earth. So it's a light bucket. It opens up here. This is the shutter. The light goes down inside, comes back down to the planet Earth. It's an unmanned satellite going around our Earth. Of course, mankind has also managed to leave planet Earth. The furthest we have got on foot is to the moon. And when you look at the moon, you can see these gray areas. Now, have you all heard this week, or some of you heard that the, the Indian mission uh, to the moon looks like it's found water? Yeah, they may have found significant amounts of water. We always thought that was possible. But many years ago, astronomers thought the gray area were seas. That's why they're called the mare. Okay. But they're not seas. It's basaltic. It's lava. Now, if you look at these images, these were taken by the Apollo astronauts in the 1970s. And this was Apollo 17. As they flew down to land on the moon, they took the images. Take your glasses off. Just a second. Look at the image. Put them back on again. Do you see the difference? You get depth of field. They were using 3D even then to try and relay what they were seeing to ground mission control to the scientists. Because by doing this, you can see the rills and valleys. By the way, there's over half a million visible craters on the surface of the moon of different sizes and different depths of formation. But these images allow you to look at the depth of field, allow you to look at the processes and the impacts. So you can use this 3D technology for real science. Even though these aren't animations, these are stills. And now if you look at the relation between the moon and the Earth, you'll see a big difference. The Earth is alive, it's geologically active, there's a lot going on. And of course, it harbors human life. Big question, are we alone? Has anybody ever heard of the Goldilocks zone? Does anybody want to have a guess what that is? What's the Goldilocks zone? Hmm. You all know it, you all know it. Okay, it's not Weetabix, that's right. It is the habitable zone, the distance between the parent star and the planet, where you may find life. Not too hot, not too cold. That's why we call it the Goldilocks, simplified. If we want to try and understand life and processes on Earth, it's not enough just to look at the geology of our own planet and other planets. We look at, have to look at the relation and the interaction between Earth and our parent star, the Sun. Now, you can do that from the ground. Of course, never ever, you know this binoculars telescope, never ever look through a telescope at the Sun. It's got a proper filters or properly supervised or it's being reflected. But there's a couple of problems. A, if you're on the ground, you've still got a lot of electromagnetic radiation, a lot of the wavelengths being lost. So you don't get the full picture. Secondly, the Earth spins, so it's nighttime. So you can't observe the sun during the night. So again, we use satellites. And there's an entire cluster, a cavalcade of satellites that, can, that are in space that constantly observe our parent star, the sun. I'm going to show you one here. And as it rotates around, in the background, you should be able to see Spaceship Earth. I call it Spaceship Earth, by the way, because if you're in a spaceship and something goes wrong, you're in trouble. If we screw up the environment and it goes wrong, humanity's in trouble. We don't have another spaceship Earth. It's really important we look at it. But there's the Earth. You can see it's quite a distance away. Good reason for that. It's a big magnet. It's got a lot of stuff going on. We don't want any interference from the Earth with our messages. So we have this satellite out there. And we have lots of them. And when I'm talking to the public or even to small school children, I don't tend to mention big numbers. They can learn about that in school or they can learn about that at home using the internet these days or books. However, in the case of the sun, you do have to give some sort of scale. A million times the size of the Earth. The processes in the center are so strong with gravitational forces that you get nuclear fusion going on. And it's just an incredible object to look at. And what you can do in space, you can look at the different wavelengths. And using stereoscopic animations, what we can look at in the different wavelengths, look at the surface of the sun. It's not a solid object. Can you see that it undulates? It moves. 
you can actually, there's like lots of little pistons going up and down all over convection currents. And around the outside of it, you can see what looks like flames, these prominences, these solar flares. And it's an awful lot of uh, magnetic activity. Because the surface isn't solid, these forces get convoluted, they get twisted, they break. They can release a lot of energy, these flares, these prominences. And if we look down towards the southern pole of the sun, you may see a big one in a minute flying off from it. If that energy, the highly charged particles, heads towards the Earth, that can have some pretty serious effects for our future society. The internet, mobile phones, navigation. More and more we rely on space applications for everyday things on the Earth. If these charged particles hit those satellites and we have no warning, then we get in trouble. Those satellites could be gone, we could lose communication, we can lose our navigation. So when we look at something like this, uh, scientific, we use it for science, but it's also an early warning system. These satellites act as an early warning system to the planet Earth. You may look at this and think it's beautiful and it's very peaceful. We now know, astronomers hundreds of years ago probably would have said it's pretty peaceful, not much happens. We now know that the universe is full of exotic phenomena, lots of things going on, continuously being born, recycled, life, death. And even in our own solar system, in our lifetime, we have seen some pretty violent processes. This was Comet Schumacher Levy 9, which was a big dirty snowball, basically of rock. Broke up into pieces and was caught by the gravity of Jupiter and it hit the planet in pieces. Now what you're looking at is a gaseous uh, surface here, a gaseous planet. But can you all see the black bruises? When I tell you each one of those is bigger than the Earth, you can see why we worry about things like this. And this is a few years ago, only a few months ago, another one hit when we saw it. Another one hit Jupiter. Luckily we are very small and space is very big, but we have to watch out for it. Where could mankind go in the next 30 years, 40 years? The red planet Mars. Even on this image that you're seeing here, this video, you can see the straight lines on the surface that were misinterpreted by scientists over 100 years ago as roads and canals. It gave this uh, uh, surgeons this idea of life in other worlds, alien life. This is a beautiful video, but I should point out, this is, this is data, okay? This is taken by European and American satellites and rovers on the surface. So although it's a video, it's real scientific data you're looking at. This is a real process. And what you're seeing here is a flyover, computer animated flyover, of the Grand Canyon on Mars, the Valles Marineris. It's much bigger than our Grand Canyon. If you were to fly through this, it would be the length of the entire United States of America. You certainly wouldn't want to fall down off the edge because it's about six kilometers in some places. So if you're on a field trip, that would end your field trip very, very badly. Okay, don't want to do that. If we head out to Saturn, again, Galileo would have looked at this, we now know that it has these beautiful ring structures. Galileo's telescope could not resolve these. He just saw what looked, looked like two Mickey Mouse ears sticking outside. He thought they were mountains. He couldn't understand when, when they went edge on, they vanished. It's because it's only about a kilometer thick. We couldn't understand what was going on. We now know it's the rings. And if you go to www.cyclops.org, that's the homepage for the Cassini mission. This is the mission that's at Saturn now. The Equinox is only finished a couple of weeks ago, and some of the imagery that's coming from that is truly astounding. It's all on the web. And it's really important because for the first time ever, we have had a spaceship in orbit as the rings have been edged onto the sun. So anything just above and below the rings casts shadows. And we're able to see processes and things going that are going to keep the scientists busy for the next 10, 20 years. You'll notice that it's not just rings, it's thousands of ringlets, bits of rock and dust and ice. Possibly the leftover from moon that tried to form, or even leftover remnants of Saturn itself, stuff that wasn't used. And it is all about evolving life in the universe. This is a stellar nursery. Stars are formed, a molecular cloud. This is the, these are the building blocks of the stars. And over billions of years, the gas can coalesce. And of course, then what will happen is you'll get your nuclear fusion in the center. And depending on how much st stuff the star gobbles up at the beginning of its life, that will actually affect the way that it lives and ultimately the way that it dies. So if you came back to a large molecular cloud several million years later, you'll probably see a lot of the gas being taken up, bright young stars. A lot of the gas and dust and nebulous stuff has been blown away by the cosmic winds coming from the stars. Those stars, if they're big enough, when they die, they don't go out with a whimper. They go out with a massive explosion. They outshine every other star in the parent galaxy. It's called a supernova. Basically a huge explosion. And this is one that happened that monks in Ireland in the Chinese sun.
Chinese cells many years ago. They recorded it. We now know it as the Crab Nebula. And it's still expanding. So if you watch this, you'll see it changing. If any astronomers here, you'll see it changing into the shape of the Crab Nebula. But as it expands, it gets cooler. Okay, it gets cooler. And as it gets cooler, and it becomes more rarefied in the optical spectrum, it will vanish after millions of years. This is the Crab Nebula. That's really the process we're looking at. Now, also when we're looking at the, the mass of the universe, when we're looking at a huge amount of nebular material, you can have a lot of stars forming. This is a globular cluster. You find them in like a halo around galaxies. Lots and lots of stars crammed into a small area. And in the center of these, and indeed in the center of galaxies and our own Milky Way galaxies, where the gravity is incredibly powerful, we find these things called black holes. And I'm not, I don't have time to show you the rest of the video, but I do want to show you this, because this is how we use it in real science. I'm very proud of this. Because what you're going to see is a black hole. Well, you're not going to see it because light doesn't escape. So we're going to represent it with a blue circle. Can you all see this? This is real data, folks. This is time-lapse pho photograph taken by telescopes around the world looking at the stars at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And although you can't see the black hole, you can see how it interacts with the stars at the center. And what you can do then is you can add the, the orbital ephemeris to it. So you can actually look at the orbital elements. And what you see is that they're not all going in one plane. You can actually rotate it. You can look around and see them all going in different areas. So we can actually use the data to interpret this in science communication to show you how the stars at the center of a galaxy interact with a black hole. And to be honest, you're probably one of the first people to see that in 3D. There's very few people who see that, apart from those at the Young Scientist. Going to talk about exoplanets, but I know we're running short of time and I have something else I have to show you. Did you enjoy that? Yeah. Now you have to come and see the show. Okay, so. Uh, so I'm going to come out of that. Sorry I'm having to cut that short, but we're, we're very short of time. Paul, just give me five minutes. Three minutes. How long? None. <laughs> Two. Oh, Lord. Right. Um, well, we're, we're not going to have time to do Celeste January because we're going to have to set this up. What I do want to show you is the future. Uh, we're working on astronomy stuff uh, with this group called Amazing Interactives. Again, that was a video, it was a film, it's very nice and it's very pretty. Oh, that's pretty. And I talk over the top of it, but it's not interactive. The only interaction is me. What you want to do is take control of the learning. Uh, what I'm going to show you is a sale. Because I think it is relevant. Because if you're looking at life in the universe, you jolly well have to understand the building blocks of life on planet Earth. How is life formed here before you can look at it somewhere else? So what we're going to do is we're going to do measurement. Remember we looked at our thumb? When we got bigger, we're going to go smaller. Down in the realm of the nanoscopic. Still another me a measuring tool, just a different unit of measurement for the science that we're trying to understand. So I'm going to start this up. I'm sorry, Paul, but I can only go so fast. Here's the cell. Now, a biology teacher or a science teacher would tell me off for doing this straight up. A, way too much information on the screen and no labels. But it's interactive, so what I can do, and I do have a Nintendo Wii, I haven't brought it with me here because it's being fixed, unfortunately, but I could give it to you and you can take control of this learning. And what I can do is I can spin it around, so I hope, way as yourself. And I think this is what you're going to see in the future. That looks like an interesting bit of there. So not only can we zoom around, but we can zoom in. Whoa, there we go. Fantastic, yeah. So, we can look at the demonstration. That's great fun, but let's be honest, I'm way off task because if we're looking for the building blocks of life, they're in the nucleus. So we're going to take everything else away and just isolate the nucleus. It's just talking to me in the background there. Um, so we can see the nuclear membrane, we can see the nuclear pores, and we can play peekaboo with the nucleus. So let's uh, zoom in a bit. Oh, okay. there we go. So we can see something going on inside, yeah? Something going on inside there. I'm not quite sure what that is. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to take everything else away. So this is the nuclear matter, and it's nanoscopic, so it's still another term. It's another term of measurement. It's how we observe, we analyze, and, and try and get results. On this scale, it's nanoscopic. Um, but even on nanoscopic, do we see much detail? We can see overall structure and the formation. But even if I fly through at this level, it's just a, a mess. So what we need to do is we need to isolate the individual strands of uh, DNA. And I am not one to sensationalize science, but this is cool. Okay, so. Okay, so now we're inside the strands. Now we can put a bit, a bit more meaning to what's going on because we can move around. We can zoom in, we can fly through. That just poked me in the eye. Okay, there we go. So you can get an idea of the structure in 3D. It's very, you can't do it in a book, you can't do it on the internet, you can sort of do it. And one of the things we're working on, and I, I, the reason why I didn't want Paul stopping me is because Paul should be very proud of, of his students, is because we had six schools working on a project on light pollution using gaming technology. It's called Thinking Worlds, 
where the pupils created their own game, and uh, sorry, uh, Mike as well, of course, forgot Mike sitting in the, from Belvedere, pupils from Belvedere as well, worked on this project. And I think, I, I know, I think the teachers expected the projects to be good, but I think the creativity and the skills that came out of that project, basically what they had to do is explain what light pollution is, this artificial lighting, and that it's not just about astronomers, that it's a, an environmental problem, it affects life, it, uh, you know, it's an energy problem, big energy. Somebody has worked out that in Europe, every year, we waste 1.6 billion euros to light escaping to space for no use whatsoever. 1.6 billion euros. How much have we given to the banks? That <laughs> makes me wonder, yeah. So, you can see this works really well, and just to finish off, what we can do is we can zoom back. Oops. And look at the actual individual building blocks. But still, as I'm still standing here in front of you, what I would do and what we do in schools is we give this to the kids. Because they never need a manual. Teachers will go, give us the manual. Give us the kids and they'll just take everything apart and start again. And that's exactly what they did with the light pollution game. And I do have it on my computer, Paul, we won't have time to show it, but it will be available on DSA, I'm hoping in about a, a month's time. So if you go to Discover Science and Engineering, the games will be up there with some explanation. Plus the authoring tool, which is free, that they used, so your pupils can have a go, take the project's part, and have a go at that themselves. Look at the DSA website. So, did you enjoy that? That's good. I have no time even to show Celestia, because Paul's a slave master. But Celestia, um, you can download it. It's, it's sitting on the screen. What I'll do is I'll load it up as, as you're heading outside. Okay? Um, it's a simulator of the solar system where you can fly around the solar system. Um, it can be downloaded from www.shatters.net. S-H-A-T-T-E-R-S.net. And if you go to shatters.net, you can download it from elsewhere. But why I say Shatters is because teachers have created educational packages to go with it. Now, I do not worry if you find it difficult to use ICT, because what, what Paul and Michael tell you very cunningly I did is when I use ICT with the kids, I take the teachers out of the room so that they can't interfere. And then what happens is the teachers become the facilitator of knowledge, and they keep the pupils on task. You don't need to know how to use this stuff, because the kids will learn it. All of the stuff is online. It's all absolutely free of charge. It's also all on the, um, the Northern Ireland website, the, the curriculum website. And the controls, you just click and you print them out, and you can give every pupil the controls. What the packages do is they'll allow you to look at the learning outcomes. So it could be, where am I going to find extreme life in the universe? They go through the internet, they go through the books, and then they take a trip to the solar system and try and find where they would find that, the Goldilocks zone. There's a lot you can do. They can fly out to the edge of the universe, and it's all in real time. So I should point out, you can do things like shadows, and you can look at the, the elements. And just, just as you're leaving, because Paul is looking at me with that evil eye of his, um, I'll just set this up. So um, I'm going to finish off there. I hope you did. Sorry I didn't have time. It really was meant to be 70 minutes, but Paul has wiped 20 minutes or 10, 15 minutes off the set. Um, and I understand completely why, because um, I talk too much. No, because we don't have time. Uh, but just so you can see, it's two seconds, just get an idea. Because the really important thing is, a lot of the stuff that's available now for PCs, because it works on a PC, also works in 3D. So we're future-proofing the stuff. So the stuff that you're going to see here works on it, but it also works in 3D. Uh, come on, work your horrible machine. One of two. Shouldn't say it, just for saying that, it's going to kill me. Put your glasses on. Paul won't mind. Put your glasses on for two seconds. And I'll just show you Celestia working. I have to load up more 3D, more stereo, sorry. Mm, I hope I did it. If it collapses, um, it's because I haven't had a chance to set it up. But let's just see if it works. It works. Hey, OK. And I'll come around here. I'll get out of the way. And this is basically what you see when you load up. Um, I'm just going to put a few more stars on it. And it, because it's in 3D, I'm doing things here you don't have to do. It's because it's a 3D version. Tell me, does that look better now? Does that look better? And you'll see you've got the Earth. And even just simply with that one image, given that to the pupil, what can we do? Well, we can look at the different continents. We can look at the clouds. We can look at the North and South Pole and try and explain why do we have snow in the North and South Pole. We can look at the difference between day and night. So we can see day and night. So you can talk about shadows. You can talk about the seasons. You can talk about where we are in relation to the sun because you can come around and you can see the sun in the background. Um, what's all the white stuff? Light. Lights. It's the light. It's light pollution. There's a light pollution right there. So you can talk about you know, mankind's effect on the universe or, or on our solar system. We can even take, we fly out. If I press enter and ISS, what's the ISS? Does anybody know what the ISS is? International Space Station. We can fly to the International Space Station. This all works on a desktop, by the way, and it's free. Uh, it works well. But in 3D, it's fantastic because you can take a fly around in 3D and I can zoom in and just go, whoa, here we go. And there's sunrise. Oh, I wouldn't like to be astronauts on board that particular journey. Oh, dear. Right. Um, I'll slow it down. And we can travel to uh, other worlds like Saturn. 
I can even travel right out to the edge of the universe and look at constellations. And uh, I, think, I think that's really important because when you look at the stars in the sky, another thing, misconceptions, kids tend to think all the stars are the same distance away. But if you join the dots up and then fly it into space, what you see is that it's not the same. Two seconds, Paul. Um, let me explain that. Uh, for example, can we all see the constellations? Blue lines. This is the fastest I'm going. This is mad. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and fly out. If it doesn't work, I'll finish. Watch, watch the constellation. We're leaving the solar system. Can you see that? Sun, there goes the sun. So watch the lines. We're getting further and further away, further away, further away. Uh, oh. Oh, my. Travel far enough out, you can make no sense of it because the stars aren't all the same distance away. It's great in 3D, by the way, because it allows you to see the interactions. But those sort of things, very simple little interactions with the kids, I see, I think, make the, the journey more relevant. Folks, I'm out of time. My name's Robert Hill. Hope you enjoyed that. Have a nice Saturday. Thank you. <laughs>